All right, well, thank you everyone for, for joining us on a, what is a busy October evening in, in Chicago with the Cubs game and, and many other things going on, and especially on a gloomy, a gloomy October evening, which is perhaps somewhat appropriate for tonight's discussion. Um, you know, the, the discussion of North Korea is one that raises a lot more problems than it does solutions. And while we may not find solutions tonight, I hope that what we can do is, is shed a little more light on, on some of the issues that are going on and perhaps looking at the future of North Korea, uh, South Korean policy towards, the re, uh, towards, towards North Korea, and perhaps f future U.S. policy as well. Um, for those who have been following the news, of course, we've seen two nuclear, nuclear tests this year, the most recent in September. And just in the past few weeks, we've seen two uh, missile launches that were reported to have failed. Uh, both by, by South Korea and the United States. Um, for those of us who are, are new to the Council, a few uh, housekeeping things. You know, the, the Council on Global Affairs is an independent, nonpartisan organization that convenes leading global voices, such as those we have tonight, conducts independent research, and engages the public to provide insight, influence, the discourse on critical global issues. Uh, we've been doing this for about 100 years. And you know, one of the things that we are, are looking to do is deepen and broaden global understanding of, of the U.S. role in the world. Uh, the views that you will hear tonight are those of the individuals on stage and do not necessarily reflect that of the council. The, the bios for tonight's speakers uh, have been rotating, but I'll introduce them, them quickly uh, anyway. To At the farthest end of the, end of the stage, we have Dr. Shin. He's currently a fellow at the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, sitting next to him, we have Dr. Lee. She is the president of the East Asia Institute. Uh, next to her, we have Dr. Greitens, currently an assistant professor at the University of Missouri. And finally, we have Dr. Lee, who is a professor of economics at Seoul National University. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do tonight, we're going to begin with, by giving everyone about five to six minutes of opening remarks. Uh, as a warning to our panelists, I'm firm, but I'm fair. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll, we'll try to keep it within that. After that, we'll, I'll follow up. I'll take the moderator's prerogative, and we'll, I'll ask one round of follow-up questions. The panelists will be allowed to respond for two to three minutes, again, firm but fair. And then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. So time is short tonight, so I don't want to go on too long about introductions. So Let's just move in. Uh, Dr. Shen, how about we start with you, and then we'll come this way. OK, thank you, Carl. Uh, uh, let me first thank EAI and the CCGA for having me this wonderful event. Uh, before I come here, I got uh, given uh, three questions regarding the uh, security matter in the Korean Peninsula. The first one is uh, North Korea's conventional threat and the preparedness of South Korea's military. Uh, the, regarding the uh, North Korea's uh, conventional threat, they have a real capability. Even the conventional uh, military capability, they have more than one million military personnel, and their military equipment and weapon system, although they are old, but it outnumbers that, that of uh, uh, Korea. And they also, the, 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 the location of Seoul, the capital of Korea, is very vulnerable. It is just uh, uh, 30 kilometers uh, uh, from the DMZ, demilitarized zone. So the, the, if North Korea decides to attack, even with its conventional long-range artillery, uh, we are very vulnerable, and a lot of people might be killed. So the, the threat is uh, overwhelming in the, the, the conventional uh, forces. Uh, but the, uh, but the, the South Korea invest uh, lots of money for the last uh, more than 30 years. So regarding the conventional threat, I think we have a certain capability to respond and deter the North Korea's uh, military provocation. Uh, and, and in addition, I think the, 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 the existence of U.S. forces Korea is very helpful. I know we jointly work together under the combined forces, uh, so we deter North Korea's conventional threat. We have no doubt that we can defeat North Korea in conventional threat. However, the problem is North Korea supposing the nuclear threat. As you well know, North Korea developed a nuclear weapon more than, uh, more than 50 years. And then they have uh, tested their weapon system for five times in particular two times this year. Now they have proved the missile capability, 
that attack Korea with their Scud and Nodong missile, and the Japan with the Nodong missile, and even Guam with the, their their Musudan missile. And then they tested in the high angle of missile shooting that that that, that averted our defense system. We have a pet three missile defense system, but it uh, cannot uh, protect uh, our people with a high angle missile attack. So Korea government decided to uh, deploy third system. Uh, so that, that is their kind of uh, US uh, missile defense system to protect USFK and possibly Korean people. Uh, we decided, uh, we announced the deployment uh, uh, last July and uh, we uh, already decided the location that start will be deployed. Uh, the problem is uh, that the response of our neighboring country, China and Russia, in particular China, they, they opposed, the, 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 they denounced the, the, our decision to deploy the system because they fear two things, I believe. Uh, they fear that the third missile, the x band radar, might watch it, their military activities. Second one is that they hate to see the strengthening rock US alliance and more Korea, United States, Japan, trilateral security cooperation. So the China mobilized its news media criticizing the Korean government decision. Uh, on the other hand, we need the Chinese cooperation to stopping North Korea's uh, nuclear development. And the UN Security Council, we need China's support. Uh, so there we face uh, some sort of a dilemma. However, the th deploying third system is a kind of matter to protect Korean people against existing threat. So that is a top priority. So we should uh, some, um, uh, stick our decision because if we cancel or delay our deployment of a third, uh, we might be influenced by China in every time we decide important decision regarding our security matter. Uh, that's the, what's going on in the Korean Peninsula now. I will uh, further uh, the, the, after uh, the questions. Dr. Shin, thank you. Uh, right on five minutes. Uh, in, in my opening remarks, I neglected to uh, thank Dr. Lee and EAI for their support for this program. Uh, we do polling with them as well as a, as a partner in South Korea. And so, yeah, we owe them a deep debt of gratitude. One other thing I forgot is to introduce the, the Korean Consul General. Uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Lee Jong-guk is here with us, as well as Ambassador uh, Lee sung lak sitting down here in front. He is... And I think in, after a 35-year career where he was the, 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 the chief envoy to the, the six-party talks for the Republic of Korea, and I know from meeting him previously in Seoul that he is one of the uh, most respected diplomats that, that Korea has produced. So thank you both for, for joining us for this evening. Now, without further ado, uh, okay. Dr. Lee. It's very good to be here, and East Asia Institute, based in Seoul, Korea, has been working very closely with the CCGA, especially doing the cross-national surveys. And also our institute has been uh, doing the national survey asking South Koreans' views toward North Korea. And Carl asked me about how South Koreans view uh, North Korea over the last 10 years. So I am talking about this opinion poll data uh, with a 20, 2005, 2010, 2015. And we usually ask South Koreans five categories. Do you think uh, North Koreans as the same people, ethnic groups, so we, or do you consider them brothers, or do you consider them as neighbors? And then we ask them whether they are uh, kind of uh, others, alter ego, nothing to do with us. And finally, we ask them whether they are enemy. So using this uh, identity questions, we uh, see there is a significant decline about the concept of weakness and also brother. Uh, for example, over the 10 years, uh, the Koreans, South Koreans, of course, used to think uh, North Koreans as the same we about 30%, but according to last year poll, it went down to 23%. On the other hand, the, the others and enemy concept uh, have increased over 10 years. So right now, about 16% uh, 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 of South Koreans regard North Korea as an enemy, 
so that's uh, quite uh, increased over this negative perception of North Korea. And especially if you see the generation gap, uh, the young Koreans in their 20s tend to regard North Korea as an enemy twice more than uh, old people, uh, older than age 60. Uh, there must be some reason um, why the South Koreans view uh, North Korea more negatively. Uh, maybe you may remember in 2010, there was a very uh, serious incident of a sinking of a Cheonan vessel um, in March, uh, killing 46 soldiers of South Korea. And also in November, there is a shelling of Yampyeong Island, uh, killing uh, two civilians and two soldiers. So this was a very unprecedented direct attack from North Korea against South Korea. So I think that uh, played a role to increase uh, negative perception of North Korea. And of course, if for the generation uh, changes, uh, you know, younger people obviously uh, do not have any memories about the Korean War and they uh, are looking at North Korea as more uh, other or other state rather than the same ethnic uh, people. So it's very interesting if you, in another questions, over the uh, last 10 years, there is a serious drop of uh, uh, Koreans who do not share any interest in North Korea. I think about 16% of drop. So uh, for young people in the 20s and 30s, um, I think uh, uh, many people regard North Korea, they, they, are, they say they are not interested in North Korea. And on the other hand, if we ask uh, the prospect of uh, unifications, many more Koreans are thinking uh, unification is inevitable, whether it's a gradual or is a sudden collapse, caused by sudden collapse of North Korea. So they think uh, unification is approaching but interestingly enough, um, many Koreans are not interested in, in paying the unification tax. Uh, I think about half of the Koreans are saying they are not interested in uh, sharing the burden. So it's a very contradiction. They are thinking the unification is approaching, but they are not willing to support unification uh, financially. Let me stop here. Uh, thank you. Dr. Gregens? Great. First of all, thank you very much to EAI and to the Chicago Council for, for having us this evening for this discussion and to all of you for, for coming uh, despite the dramatic change in the weather that we had <laughs> this week, uh, which we had in Missouri as well. Um, I think it's particularly appropriate to be talking about the future of uh, North Korea this evening, uh, in part because uh, the Chicago Council recently did some work uh, that found that across the political spectrum in the United States, um, Americans consistently identify North Korea uh, as one of the top five national security concerns facing the United States. And so it's good to have a, a focused discussion on, on North Korea. Um, I'll focus my remarks tonight on what the United States options are for policies toward North Korea and options for the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, and because we've talked a little bit already about the military aspects, I will focus more on the other major tool that often gets discussed, which is economic sanctions. Um, to start with, I'll say, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of new sanctions, uh, resolutions, and legislation that's been applied to North Korea in the past several years uh, as a result of some of the nuclear and, and missile tests that, uh, that Carl mentioned. Um, and sanctions are a useful tool. And when we look at the sanctions legislation uh, and, and where things are at, um, there are a lot of ways that the enforcement of existing sanctions could be tightened. So one of the most common questions is, do we need more sanctions? Um, but one of the real challenges that uh, the US, that South Korea, that the international community face is enforcement of existing sanctions. And just to give you one example of what I mean when I talk about enforcement of existing sanctions, North Korea has a lot of maritime traffic. It has, has ships that go uh, in various places across the world. And um, there are three things that allow those ships to operate um, that we could look at that would uh, potentially make it more difficult for North Korea to do some of the military and illicit activities that it's been engaged in. Um, one is how those vessels are insured. Uh, the, the second is how they're registered. You actually have to register 
a, a vessel under a particular company. And the third is that those vessels have to fly a particular national flag when they sail in international waters. So the, we, the flagging of these vessels is something that you could look at. Um, there have been cases where uh, companies have either insured, registered, or assisted with the flagging of North Korean vessels um, that, that probably should have been prevented by the sanctions uh, that we already have on the books, but it's a matter of, of actually catching the cases where this is happening and enforcing what the, the sanctions that exist. Um, the other thing that I think it's important for the United States, South Korea, and the international community to think about when we talk about sanctions uh, is that sanctions are a tool in our strategy. They're not by themselves a strategy. And we run into this issue uh, particularly with North Korea because we sanction North Korea for a lot of different things. There are a lot of things that North Korea does that the international community has said it should not be doing. Uh, that includes its nuclear proliferation, its human rights abuses, and its involvement in illicit activities such as the drug trade, counterfeiting American currency, it makes the world's best uh, $100 counterfeit notes. This, the Secret Service refers to them as super notes. Um, they actually have to be sent to a special bank to be the normal machines and banks don't pick up on these counterfeits. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not actually clear uh, if North Korea changed one of those things, for example, if it, if it magically decided to get rid of its nuclear program, which is unlikely, um, but it kept its uh, political prison camps, um, it, it's not clear that that would produce any change in the sanctions or that it should produce a change in the sanctions that we apply. Um, and so I think it's actually easy to overestimate the effect that, that sanctions may have on North Korea's external behavior because the chance of the sanctions being lifted uh, without dramatic change on multiple areas of North Korea's behavior is, is I think, pretty, pretty small. Um, so that leads to the question of what we should expect sanctions to do and what sanctions have accomplished. Um, so I realize I'm sounding fairly, fairly pessimistic here. Um, George Kennan, who authored the original containment strategy uh, that the U.S. Uh, used in various forms throughout the Cold War against the Soviet Union, talked about diplomacy, including the containment strategy, as gardening, uh, which is not a very exciting metaphor. Um, but he said that the job of the strategist and the diplomat is um, not so much to sort of force a change in behavior overnight, but to create the conditions that push uh, uh, other countries, and particularly adversaries' behavior in one direction or another. And um, I think that's a useful way of thinking about North Korea policy, because we often focus on what, what we can't do, right? It looks like our policy is not working. Um, but the purpose of a lot of the sanctions is actually to say um, to the North Korean regime, look, we can't force you to stop doing whatever you're doing inside your borders, but um, we can say to you that we will not facilitate this. We will not facilitate you forcing people to live in poverty and oppression uh, while you're living a high life with, with luxury goods imported from our country, uh, our countries. So that's one of the, I think, the, the purposes of, uh, of the sanctions regime. Um, and I think the other, uh, and this is sort of to try to end on a, a positive note, um, that I think uh, the sanctions have been partially successful in creating a change in the relationship inside North Korea um, between the, the North Korean regime and North Korea's ordinary citizens. Um, in the past 10 or 15 years, uh, we've seen the expansion of marketization processes and the growth of an underground market in North Korea that uh, some analysts estimate today is as big or bigger than the formal economy. Um, I teach in a political science department. One of the things we know is that when an authoritarian regime, when a dictatorship is able to get money uh, from abroad and distribute it from the top down, that helps them survive. When uh, an authoritarian regime has to depend on taxing or extracting money from the bottom up from its own citizens, it's more dependent on them. 
And that is much less conducive to surviving as a dictatorship than, than the top-down way of earning and distributing income. Um, so I think the more that our, poli our economic policies can facilitate that sort of bottom-up engagement, a type of economic engagement that goes directly to the North Korean people and not through the regime, um, I think the better off uh, the, the, the ordinary citizens inside North Korea will be and the better prospects we have for eventual positive, uh, albeit gradual, change on the Korean Peninsula. Um, I'll stop there because I have a feeling I'm nearing my six minutes. You're close. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kim? Okay, it's my great privilege to be here. Uh, I will talk about the economy in North Korea. I'm an economist. Uh, we know that the North Korean economy is not that uh, successful. Uh, South Korean income per capita is now about 27,000 US dollars. But North Korea is about uh, 750 dollars which is uh, less than 3% of South Korea's. Uh, huge differences between South Korea and North Korea for the last 70 years. The main reason for this uh, uh, failure of North economy is institutional problems. Uh, but this economy has uh, been undergoing very uh, difficult times in 1990s. But now is the current economy is a bit better than uh, mid and the late 1990s. Uh, one of the reasons why this economy has been a bit better uh, is that the uh, uh, Kim Jong-un regime has uh, encountered uh, rather good uh, relations with China in terms of uh, trade. Uh, trade volume has increased a lot from 2010 uh, to 2014. Uh, therefore, this trade increase accounts for about 50% of the increases of gross rates uh, from 2011 to 2014. We estimate that the uh, average gross rate uh, from 2011 to 2014 is about the 1.1% uh, to 3%. Uh, my estimate is a bit higher, 2.3%, but Bank of Korea's estimate is 1.1%. So half of this uh, uh, gross rates can be accounted for by increased trade with China in particular. particular. And the remaining part is, uh, can be explained by marketization, as Shina mentioned. Now, North Korean households survive on markets, not on uh, official places. Uh, more than 70% of North Korean households derive their income from market activities, like uh, selling something at the markets, or smuggling something from China and selling it to North Korea, etc. This is a big part of the economy nowadays. Uh, this helps uh, North Koreans uh, survive, but also increase growth rates as well. Uh, but the problem is that uh, last year, uh, trade volume with China has decreased. Also, uh, agricultural production has decreased because of bad weather. Therefore, last year, a record negative growth rate, minus 1.1% last year. And uh, this year, North Korea faces sanctions. And we know that uh, China is a critical player in enforcement of sanctions. Uh, or if uh, sanctions can be successful, uh, North Korea economic growth rate will be another negative uh, domain. But we have some record of this uh, imposed sanctions by China. Uh, we can have, have a look at the trade statistics between China and North Korea. Uh, China started sanctions from April this year. Uh, the main uh, target of sanction is trade, particularly mineral, mineral resources. Uh, in particular, uh, coal export, because coal export is about 40% of total North Korean trade with China. Uh, UN Security Council resolution forbids any export of mineral resources except uh, these uh, liability purposes. Uh, in April this year, uh, coal export uh, by dec uh, decreased by 20% uh, compared with uh, last year, the same period. Uh, it uh, further decre it decreased also in May by uh, 13%. And then by minus 5% five, uh, five, five in, in June and minus 1% in July. And so basically, uh, in April, it decreased a lot, but over time, the decrease rate has been diminished. And in, 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 uh, in August, it increased by 35%. And so basically, uh, from July and August, it's, it's reversed. Basically, so uh, from time being, for time being, we estimate okay there was some effect on sanctions early stage, 
but at this stage, central effect is uh, basically unseen. And so, uh, you know, we, we can't see uh, any through enforcement sanctions at this stage. Thank you. All right, thank you. So for the first round of questions, uh, Dr. Lee, I'd like to turn to you first. I know that you're on the, the Presidential Committee for Unification Preparation. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could answer actually two questions. So the first, can you describe the current, South, like the current mood in South Korea in terms of unification? You, you talked a little bit about that, but in, instead of the public, how about within the government? If you can kind of very quickly uh, summarize the current South Korean position. And then if you could outline the steps that you think South Korea needs to take to prepare for unification, when and if it does come. When it's coming. <laughs> that's, that's a very tough question. <laughs> oh, well, um, when this government started in 2013, uh, our President Park geun has started with uh, trust building uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that is based on strong deterrence and then uh, building up the mutual trust with the uh, cooperation and exchange, and finally leading to uh, peaceful unifications, right? And then from the 2014, early uh, 2014, uh, she began to talk about the uh, unification bonanza theory, trying to say, uh, trying to, to give a signal to North Korea the unification is good to North Koreans as well, not to mention of South Koreans and also international society. However, you know, uh, since uh, last year, and especially this year, uh, North Korea, Kim Jong-un, has advanced nuclear and missile threats with all these technical advancements. So uh, it's very difficult from this year, uh, it's difficult to say about the unification. So even though Dr. Kim, uh, Professor Kim byung yeon and myself uh, belong to the, uh, this presidential committee preparing unifications, uh, these days uh, uh, this, this is, we used to have a lot of economic project, you know. Mm -hmm. However, uh, this year the mood is such bad. So rather than talking about unification, we are more concentrated on uh, sanctions against Pyongyang to, to give up their uh, bad uh, nuclear uh, programs at, at this moment. And in South Korea, are the sanctions viewed as being effective right now? It's very early to say uh, sanction is effective or not. And, and I guess uh, uh, two uh, presenters here uh, discussed sanction effect already. Uh, but the important thing is uh, we have to make sanction effective from now on, rather than talking about, because sanction started from March, right? Mm -hmm. It's very early to discuss whether it's uh, 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 ineffective or effective. Important thing, our discussion should be concentrated on how we can make uh, our sanctions effective. And for that purpose, it's very important for South Korea and also for USA to invite Beijing to participate in this multilateral sanction in an honest way. Um, Dr. Kim, turning to you. Dr. Lee just mentioned that there were previously quite a few economic projects that were going on. Of course, one of the, 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 the big signature projects was the Kaesong, the industrial complex there that was the, a, a joint project. Of course, that's been shut down. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how that has, been, how that has had an effect, both in South Korea, how it's viewed in South Korea, the, the, the shutdown, but also how, what effect it's had in North Korea. This was you know, such a big project that was, when it was shut down, it was a kind of a shock to everyone. It was a, kind of seen as a, a step of last resort. And no one really thought at the time that it was on the block or it could be, could be uh, closed off. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, guess in this complex can be seen as kind of experiment of unification. So that plays a big role to uh, symbolize the importance of unification and how to approach unification from small projects to large projects. Uh, obviously, Kaesong and the complex provide some kind of uh, uh, form of activities to, uh, to educate North Koreans, expose uh, North, North Korea to market economy. And so it plays some roles. But our concern was that uh, so many of this uh, uh, complex went to the authority of North Korea. Uh, this money can, could be used for uh, some kind of uh, projects like uh, nuclear weapon programs. That worries us a lot. And uh, so the government decided to uh, withdraw uh, our uh, people from North Korea and uh, shut down. Uh, it, it led to shutdown of the complex. 
Uh, I, I don't know whether the decision was good or not. Uh, it's at this stage, you, you can't tell. But if uh, this uh, uh, shutting down of the complex led to uh, give some incentives for North Koreans to change its behavior, I would say it plays a positive role. Basically, uh, North Korea had to understand with this kind of behavior, they, they cannot be accepted by the international community and by South Korean community as well. So uh, if uh, North Koreans can learn lessons from this, uh, uh, this project's uh, performance, then I think that decision was, uh, can, be can be justified. So uh, I regard this tension as kind of uh, uh, thing we uh, step back uh, just one step back, but we expect two steps forward uh, afterwards. That is what we expect from this sanction. Uh, can you give us an idea of how much money was being spent by South Korea that was going into Gaesung and how much money from, of that was going perhaps to the regime and how much was then going down to the workers? Well, uh, cash doesn't have any tax. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we can't tell how much money was, uh, you know, the, went to the authorities in North Korea. Mm. Basically, it, it's not uh, known at, at all. But what ha what's happened is that uh, uh, North Korean workers received, uh, did not receive money from us. Basically, South Korean employers gave money to the authorities. And they uh, took some money uh, from this uh, one, and then uh, they distributed money to the workers. Therefore, uh, basically, that is up to them how to dis dis distribute money. But what we know that is that uh, some part of this money uh, was spent on taxes and social security contributions, and uh, some part of this money was changed uh, to uh, rations. Okay, and the workers received ration, uh, not receiving that their salary in cash. All right. uh, Dr. Shin, in, in your remarks, you talked about the conventional threats and the nuclear threats. Uh, I'd like to talk, ask you about the asymmetric th threats that, that North Korea poses. So it's one thing that you, you didn't discuss is things like cyber attacks. Uh, could you go into North Korea's cyber capabilities and how they've used them against South Korea? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, pro, uh, before, to mention, before mentioning the cyber security matters, I omitted one thing during my opening uh, remark. That is, the, this is my first time to visit uh, Chicago, but I'm a big fan of uh, Chicago Cubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago Cubs wins the World Series this year. Yeah. North Korea's uh, cyber capability is unknown, frankly speaking. You know, it is very hard to detect what kind of a capability do they have. But uh, we gather information from North Korean defector and other way, and they, they raised a uh, cyber warrior in their university. And they, they maintain the closed internet system. Their internet is not connected directly to the uh, globe. They have a limited line with uh, China. So it is very hard uh, what kind of ability they do really have. But when they attack South Korea, they send their internet warrior to China or other side of the world, and then they attack Korea. But sometimes we got suffer. They try to hack our banking system, try to infiltrate our social uh, system like uh, as, as a, a train or a subway, so which might cause great uh, danger, threat inside uh, Korea. So anyway, we also uh, uh, build our capability to respond to the kind of threat. And uh, the, but so in defense, we have a certain capability. But regarding the offense, I think because of their uh, system is not directly linked to the international internet, so it is very uh, limited. Uh, turning to you, Dr. Greitens, uh, I know in, in your past work you've done a lot, of, a lot of research on North Korea's illicit economy. Mm -hmm. So if you could give us a, a rundown of what those activities were, uh, any estimates of how much money they actually generated for the regime, and if they're still continuing, or if perhaps they've increased due to, to heavier sanctions, things like the super notes that you mentioned, uh, uh, illegal, illegal narcotic manufacturing, and where the distribution goes from that. Yeah, sure. So um, North Korea has a history of involvement in this basket of activities that I would call illicit activities that dates back uh, to the mid-1970s. 
Um, that includes manufacturing and trafficking in both opiates and methamphetamine, uh, and uh, counterfeiting the world's best uh, 100, US hundred dollar bills, the, the ones that the Secret Service refers to as the, the super notes. Um, it also includes things like uh, manufacturing counterfeit products, counterfeit cigarettes, counterfeit pharmaceuticals. So for a while there was counterfeit Viagra that was turning up in, in Japan uh, and China that was being manufactured, uh, it, it looked like inside, inside North Korea. Um, so North Korea has a, a long history of being involved in these activities that tracks pretty closely with the economic downturn in North Korea. In the 70s, North Korea defaulted on its debts. It's lo it lost the ability to borrow, um, which is very unusual. And, um, and so the, the country had a hard currency crisis. And so a lot of these efforts were ways that the North Korean regime, in particular, uh, the, the elites, the, the officials in Pyongyang, sought to earn the cash that they needed to survive and, and enjoy a, a prosperous lifestyle. Um, but what we've also seen is that that basket of activities has been pretty highly adaptable over time. Um, the drug trade has fluctuated, it shifted from primarily opiates to more amphetamine type stimulants as the market it, uh, for these drugs changed and as North Korea's capacity for production shifted um, due to changes in the industrial environment and, in, and the agricultural uh, sort of um, performance of the country. Um, and so this activity has always been something where North Korea has adapted quickly both to uh, sanctions and pressure from outside and to seeing new opportunities. Um, so some of the biggest changes in the last few years have been uh, that, that there was actually a, an apparent decline in the circulation of these super notes. Um, a, a few actually recently turned up in, on the Chinese border just a couple of months ago. But before that, there hadn't been a seizure of these super notes in, that was publicly known about in, in several years. Um, so there's a lot of speculation that perhaps North Korea had stopped the currency counterfeiting, and that's now kind of been called into question again with this seizure in China. Um, the other thing is that North Korea has always looked for new sort of lines of money-making activity. Um, so there was a, actually an online gaming operation that took place in China a few years ago where um, North Koreans were coming into China to make money through, through online gaming. Um, the other big trend is the export of North Korean labor overseas. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the reason why this is uh, useful for North Korea is that the North Korean government typically signs the contracts with, uh, to provide the labor. And so the money goes into the North Korean uh, system at the top and then is, is uh, dispersed, as, um, as was described, uh, from the top down. So the, the regime and the officials receive the money from abroad and then they're able to distribute it either as rations or sometimes as salaries. Um, and that, that obviously is a structure that works to the, the advantage of the, the North Korean regime. And so usually when North Korea seeks out these new economic activities, it tries to structure them in such a way that the money comes in at the top and then goes downward. Um, so those are the, the major changes that we've seen. Um, the amount is probably less important than that structure that I just described because it's, it doesn't um, actually necessarily take that much money to sustain a relatively small elite in Pyongyang, um, but the, the way that that income is distributed inside North Korea appears to be sort of what's politically most consequential um, and most important for understanding sort of, you know, how long North Korea is going to be around and its ability to continue to operate. Okay, so now I'd like to open it up the, to the floor if there are questions. I, I will ask that if you have a question, you follow the, the three good rules of, of question asking. Number one, please identify yourself. Uh, number two, please keep it short. And most importantly, number three, please make sure that it ends in a question mark. <laughs> I like those rules. <laughs> uh, wait, wait for a microphone. We have one coming around. There you go. Uh, my name is Douglas Asbury. I'm a retired United Methodist minister. Um, I um, am a student, obviously, of the history of Christianity and of uh, theology. And many of the things that I've seen coming out of uh, that refer to North Korea 
uh, are reminiscent of the time when Roman uh, emperors would declare themselves as gods and uh, everything would flow from the god to the people and the god was uh, worshipped and uh, there were various rituals surrounding the worship of the god and uh, I, I know that you're familiar with the statues of uh, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il uh, all over North Korea and probably there will be statues of Kim Jong-un eventually but uh, I'm just wondering what the uh, difficulties are of uh, normal uh, uh, governments trying to negotiate with a government that actually perceives itself to be godlike and to have control of life and death and all benefits that come to the people and how those difficulties can be overcome. Would anyone like to volunteer to answer that? <laughs> Negotiating with, with North Korea. Uh, we, we, we have someone in the audience who would be perfect to answer that. However, he's not on stage this evening. Um, Dr. Shin or Dr. Lee, maybe, would you like to take a I shot think, at that? Yeah, let me start. Maybe uh, Professor Lee will uh, help me. Uh, it is very difficult, as you know. So in, in negotiating with North Korea, it's, it's unexpected because although their diplomat had made uh, some decision and resulted to some kind of agreement with other diplomats, it is turned down by their own authority. We can see that uh, in two, two, 2012, uh, leap day agreement. You know, their diplomat made a kind of uh, agreement with the United States. However, that it was turned down two weeks later they announced the launch of a long-range missile, long-range rocket. So it is very unexpected, and their system itself is very, uh, very uh, hard to the, the, the see the decision-making system because sometimes uh, Kim Jong Un, the top leader, just directly order you should do this. However, sometimes they listen. He listened to the voice of his advisor. So we do not uh, expect uh, how can the decision. Um, uh, made on inside of North Korea, and uh, the agreement uh, cannot sustain if the leader is not satisfied. Yeah, North Korea is obviously a very abnormal communist country because it is based on Kim family worship, right? Mm -hmm. So now the Kim Jong-un, the young, uh, relatively young compared to the, the, his father Kim Jong-un took power. So, uh, 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 it's uh, uh, very difficult to negotiate with them, but ironically, because he's God in North Korea, if God changes his mind, the negotiation can get through quickly. <laughs> so it is important thing is that Kim Jong-un, like his father, had believed that having a nuclear power will guarantee his survival. If we you know, push him to recalculate, you know, having nuclear weapons are dangerous and actually uh, very harmful to his regime survival, he may change his mind. So it's very important for us uh, to push him to uh, redirect, his, uh, to change his mind. Yes. Dr. Kim, you want to follow up? Yeah, I think it's difficult to negotiate with uh, the authorities there because uh, Chu Chai ideology is based on one man system. So uh, that is difficult, but I think it's the, something we have to think about is that uh, North Korea is not closed economy, it's open economy in terms of trade uh, dependence. So many people go and come uh, you know, the, to China, uh, therefore they understand what's going on outside. And also inside North Korea, a soap drama from South Korea is widely watched by many uh, North Koreans. And Chinese uh, visit North, Koreans, uh, North Korea uh, this kind of interactions, I think, is the, uh, brings uh, this Christianity or other religions uh, to, to emerge in, in North Korea. I think it's the bottom approach is more uh, applicable rather than you know, the top-down approach. Yeah, down here in front. Yeah, Sandy Finkel. I'm a physician. How secure is King Jong-un? I mean, he's, he's an obvious dictator, but I know he's executed members of his family. Uh, is it possible to be a coup to try to push him out? And I don't know if you have any information on something like that. <laughs> Sheena? So um, when North Korea uh, transferred power to Kim Jong-un, they pulled off something that very, very few dictatorships have ever done. A hereditary succession of power is unlikely in a dictatorship of any kind. And to do two in a row 
uh, is very, very unusual. Um, so I would not, unfortunately, for the, the purposes of, of this discussion, I would not underestimate um, the Kim family's ability to survive and to do things that are very, very difficult politically to do. Um, Kim Jong-un has um, sort of a, an unusual task in that he, what he has to do is manage both sort of the, the members of the elite uh, and the, the people of North Korea. Um, and typically when we look at how dictatorships have lost power, about two thirds of them actually lose power to, to other insiders. Um, and so that's I think part of why you see a lot of these efforts being focused primarily on purges and uh, violence and coercion, as well as economic rewards for members of the elite. That's part of why North Korea is such a sort of an elite centered political system to the detriment of, of ordinary citizens and ordinary families. Um, but it's because those are the people who could plausibly remove Kim Jong-un from power. Um, but uh, what we've seen is a, a pretty clear effort to use both violence and economic rewards uh, to try to prevent that from happening. And the other thing that's sort of a, a rule of studying systems like North Korea, if there, is, if there is a rule, is that change is almost always unexpected. And that's because everybody in the system has an incentive to lie. Uh, because you're afraid of being targeted for violence, because you're afraid of being targeted for repression, for execution, um, you're afraid of your family being punished, everyone from the very top of the system to the very bottom has an incentive to conceal what they actually think and to show more loyalty and more support for the regime than they do. And the, the reason that matters is that then you every, sort of, when everyone plays along and acts as if they are loyal, then people's perception is that it's very, very risky to be the only person who doesn't like the guy at the top. Uh, and so even if people actually disagree or are unhappy, um, they perceive that the penalty is going to be very, very high because they think they're the only ones who, who feel that way. And so what happens is that um, you can have a, actually a, a much higher level of dissatisfaction than we know about. And when one or two people then step forward, um, so you've probably seen pictures of the Berlin Wall or something like what happened in the Arab Spring, oftentimes one person then can actually trigger a very quick cascade uh, because people start to see that others around them are actually unhappy. Um, and so it, it's one of the reasons, uh, just because of human psychology, um, that it's actually very hard to predict when change will come um, because of this, this incentive everyone has to conceal what they uh, believe until some, some sort of unexpected event happens that leads people to, to realize that, that, um, that there are other people who feel the way they do. Dr. Kim? Yeah, this execution of uh, the officials uh, is, uh, is well known. Uh, that is uh, unprecedented uh, in his father and his grandfather's times. But uh, at the same time, uh, these market activities actually empower households because they feel they're autonomous and dependent because they make their money by themselves. Uh, they received the ration uh, previously. At that time, they believed that survival depended on the authorities. But now they believe uh, the money is uh, their basically performance and their, uh, you know, what they have earned by themselves. Uh, this, uh, uh, this creates difficult situations for the dictator because the dictator has to uh, give something uh, in return for this kind of marketization. Therefore, uh, Kim Jong-un uses a skinship sort of uh, uh, intimate relations with uh, the people. So he said many times, I love you, I love people. That is also unprecedented because in this way, he uses fear politics to top officials, but at the same time, he uses a kind of uh, a close relationship with the people. That reflects the weakness of the system. Uh, Maybe we if I add something, I think that we can see the systematic uh, structure of North Korea. As you know, they have a vulnerability. It's a totally failed regime. It's just one man dictation without an efficient governing system. And it's really outdated. But on the other hand, no North Korean people never experienced democracy. 
It is just the uh, old kingdom changed to the Japanese colonization, and now it's the Kim's kingdom, Kim's family. They learn 70 years on North Korea. They have probably some kind of know-how. And lastly, I think that the, what is the last thing? I just missed the but Anyway, <laughs> this kind of a rationale uh, still exists in North Korea, so we do not look down the, the strengths of North Korea, but we don't know. We had a question right down here in front. Uh, thanks, Avi Porat, active in the council. Uh, there's a rumor that in less than three weeks they'll elect a new president in the United States. <laughs> uh, one of the two candidates has proposed uh, a couple of things concerning Korea. Uh, one, that co no, South Korea developed nuclear weapons on its own, and second, to remove the American uh, forces. Uh, what impact would any one of those actions have on North Korea? How would they react to those kind of things? Dr. Lee? Well, um, many Koreans are observing very carefully uh, the election here. Uh, and uh, it's not only Koreans. I, I'm, I'm meeting Japanese and Chinese, and they are looking at uh, this election with uh, great uh, interest. And Mr. Trump's uh, saying about uh, Korea or even Japan, you know, they can defend and they can develop their own nuclear weapons. Uh, that was a very shocking statement to us. And uh, we uh, worried uh, uh, that illustrate the kind of declining security commitment to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but obviously, I, I believe the American system so oh, obviously he is losing in the, in the in campaign at this moment. So we expect uh, America will continue to defend South Korea, of course, and also will uh, play a very constructive role for the peace and stability in Asia region, East Asia and Asia Pacific in, in general. So it's very, very important. Uh, I know that the foundations of American politics has been changing because some Korean, uh, some Americans are not happy with the major parties. But nevertheless, I think it's very important in this kind of 21st century, you know, all countries are interdependent, and there must be a, a strong country playing uh, a role, uh, contributing the public goods in the world, and public goods, one of public goods is uh, peace, right? And also the open trade. So therefore, I think it's, it's very important for for Americans uh, to engage in international society and promote the, all this important uh, public guests in the world. If I add, I think that uh, regarding the, some, some, there is a misunderstanding of the Korean people's uh, willingness to develop our own nuclear weapon. I think that's not true. Uh, because we have uh, some kind of traditional rivalry with North Korea, they do try to have a nuclear weapon. So we got uh, some feeling that we should do that. But the, if we know the reality of the, if we develop the economic sanction, if it's poor like that, that maybe the, government, the supporting rate of a nuclear weapon is drastically down. On the other hand, uh, I think that as uh, Professor Lee mentioned, uh, we trust the United States as uh, assurance uh, you know, regarding the extended deterrence. You know, ye yesterday uh, in the Washington DC, we got an agreement uh, between two plus two. Uh, 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 the, the foreign minister, defense minister, we gather together and we evaluate the North Korea's nuclear threat and we establish a new committee that discuss and make uh, implement the, uh, the extended deterrence. In that way, I think we can move on to deter the uh, North Korea's threat. If I can just follow up quickly, in, in a previous life I was based in Seoul and one of the things we, I was doing there was public opinion polling. And this support for nuclear weapons was something we looked very closely at. Uh, historically, support has been 55, 60%, you know, going back uh, a decade at least. But while I was there, I ran one poll where we asked about support and then we followed up with, well, would you still support if? And it was, you know, our, if you're cut off from the nuclear fuel cycle, essentially you can't import uh, nuclear fuel anymore from the international community. Or if there were economic sanctions, or if there were penalties from the U.S. And so while it was 60% at the beginning, 
by the time we, we went through and, and looked at all the ramifications, it had fallen under 20%. Mm -hmm. And so the, the support for nuclear weapons in South Korea is, is quite overstated at times if you don't ask right. those follow-up questions. Yeah. Uh, over here, Dr. Dr. O in the orange jacket. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Bonnie O. I'm a retired distinguished professor of Korean studies uh, from Georgetown University. Um, I am saddened to uh, hear that there is a, a diminishing possibilities for reunification according to the polls of young people and things. And my question is uh, particularly addressed to Professor Lee. I recently, and I have actually been observing demographic changes in South Korea, and South Korea is becoming increasingly multicultural and multiracial society. And that presents a problem in terms of uh, reunification. That is, you know, one of the strongest factors for asserting or planning or hoping reunification is the commonality in ethnicity, you know, our ethnic common origin. But if South Korea becomes a multiracial society, I think that gets diminished. So I would appreciate Professor Lee to address that question. Thank you so much. So you are asking the declining support and also interest in North Korean affairs and also support for unification among the young generation and also this uh, uh, multicultural uh, uh, family, right? Um, I think uh, uh, the more young Koreans are very proud of uh, South Korean nationalism, but uh, their nationalism doesn't extend to the brothers and sisters in North Korea com uh, compared to uh, their uh, parent generations. So in that matter, uh, their ethnic identity with North Korea has been weakened. And, and you are right, because one marriage out of 10 are uh, intercultural marriage. So uh, the number uh, of uh, so tamuna gajong, the multicultural family, uh, will be increasing. So therefore, uh, we, uh, the Korean government and many uh, NGOs and universities try to uh, integrate these uh, young people. I think they are entering like uh, uh, middle school years like that. Uh, so they will enter the Korean labor market in less than 10 years, and they'll go to army, right? If a sons, they have to serve the, the mandatory uh, draft system. So uh, we we'll we very much invest to, to teach, not only teach properly, uh, because they, often their mothers cannot command the good Koreans. Uh, so they are kind of educationally, uh, uh, they don't, they lose advantage. So we try to, to uh, support their language skills, and also we like to socialize them to the mainstream Korean values, including, you know, uh, patriotism and also uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, saying, uh, emphasizing the uh, ethnicity. Uh, even though it's a plural ethnicity, uh, it's the uh, same people as a Republic of Korea. If I add just one thing that we do not seek uh, the unification to maintain single ethnicity. I think we seek unification for better life, so better economy and more freedom. So I think that the single ethnicity is not matter in our uh, uh, yeah, but I follow up the, what the Dr. Shin said. Actually, that there are slight changes in opinion polls. It used to be the case that uh, we are one people as Koreans, therefore we have to unify. But that kind of support has diminished uh, to some extent. Uh, on, on contrast, it increased uh, number of people saying that, uh, okay, we have to unify because uh, that brings us benefits. So costs are there, but probably uh, economic benefits are much, much higher. Uh, I estimated the, the, the benefits of uh, unification. If unification uh, is, is, uh, is, is coming uh, through uh, reasonably well, sort of, uh, uh, you know, the organized ways, such as uh, transition of the North Korean economy to market economy, and the peaceful unification, and gradual, gradual unification, uh, that will bring a lot of benefits to uh, not only South Korea, but also to North Korea, 
North Korean economy will grow by 13%, and South Korean economy will grow uh, by 0.8% point. Therefore, uh, that brings a lot of benefits. That persuades the young people, okay, unification is good for us. Therefore, that kind of aspect actually support increases. Can I, can I add something to that? Please, Dr. Um, Greitens. I'm actually working on a, a book project now about the resettlement of people who come from North Korea, refugees, defectors, uh, who come to South Korea and uh, are, are learning to become citizens and participants in South Korean society. Um, I actually came uh, partly for a, a workshop and fellowship from the East Asia Institute, which was a terrific experience in March. Uh, to talk to scholars and to North Korean defectors and refugees about this experience. Um, and as, as I'm sure you know, the, um, it has been a challenging process over time to try to figure out how to assist people who've grown up in the North Korean system in settling into life in the sort of advanced market economy and democratic society that South Korea now has. Uh, the longer the two country, the, the two parts of the Korean Peninsula have been separated, um, the bigger divergence in lifestyle and and thinking has uh, has accumulated. Um, and so, when you actually look at the the language that the Ministry of Unification uses about the resettlement process, um, it, it very clearly says that uh, people who were born in North Korea, who come from North Korea to the South. Um, do not fit under this sort of multicultural South Korea, but they do come from a different culture and a different way of life. And, um, and so even among ethnic Koreans, there is a cultural and a, a lifestyle uh, a difference that has to be tackled. And, and the South Korean government over successive administrations um, uh, and especially in, in the last couple of years, has really redesigned its assistance programs and has put a lot of assistance toward resettling people, in part as a recognition of how difficult it is to come, even if you share ethnic ties, um, how very difficult and challenging it can be to come from uh, a place like North Korea with the economy structured the way it is, with the political culture uh, that North Korea has. Um, and to facilitate a transition to being a, a democratic citizen and a participant in a market economy. Um, and so I think that that's something that, you know, when we think about um, this change of citizenship that, and the way that, that Koreans think about citizenship, um, this shift toward a sort of more civic and a less ethnic notion um, of, of citizenship, there's still a way for that to accommodate and facilitate unification. Um, in a very positive way, I think, based on, on the discussions I've had, not just with, with government officials, but with the people who've come from North Korea who've been through this process. Uh, the gentleman here in the, the blue shirt. That's a good point. Rather than Hi, that. Zach Smith. Um, so in terms of China's support for North Korea, could you talk a little bit about the political and economic rationale it has for propping up the regime, as well as how conditional you see the support? Would they ever withhold it under certain circumstances, or are they pretty locked in at this point? Thank you. China? Anyone? Dr. Kim? Well, I think Chinese support uh, is, uh, can be understood uh, from two points. The first one is economic benefits, uh, because three northeast provinces in China uh, depend upon North Korean trade a lot. Uh, but more important, I think, is North, Korean, uh, is North Korea provides kind of uh, justification for the Communist Party's regime in China. Uh, therefore, Perhaps it does not want to uh, any kind of uh, destabilize North Korea uh, in any way. Uh, that is their interest. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I think the, what they do uh, now in regarding sanctions uh, is, uh, is difficult to understand because uh, it's not binary choice. Nothing to do is zero, and uh, causing uh, collapse is 100. But given this kind of close ties, economic ties between China and North Korea, it, uh, China can, is able to choose neither zero nor 100. It can choose, say, 50, optimal point, uh, causing not, uh, the club, not, not causing the collapse, but uh, uh, giving pressure on, on the regime uh, to comply with the United, States, uh, United Nations uh, request. That is what we expect. 
for China, uh, China's uh, Chinese policy toward the Korean Peninsula, they have uh, three principles. One is uh, they don't want North Korea having nuclear weapons. So they are supporting denuclearization of North Korea. And second, they value the regime stability uh, of North Korea. So that's why they are very quite reluctant uh, of uh, this uh, regime collapse because they are afraid of uh, refugees and, and, and many issues. And third, if there is a unification, so, uh, Chinese are saying they, they support peaceful unifications, right? So whenever we talk to, to Chinese, they, in principle, they are saying, oh, oh of, course, of course, we support unification of two Koreas. However, they are very sensitive about the peninsula issues uh, because uh, if unification arrives, uh, I guess majority of us believe that they'll be under the South Korean terms, right? So therefore, uh, they don't like uh, the, the, uh, North Korea disappear because North Korea is a buffer zone uh, between the U.S. forces, uh, uh, bases, South Korea, and China. So uh, uh, how you know, uh, we can persuade about uh, this uh, keeping the alliance with USA and uh, uh, still having base, uh, U.S. bases in, in southern part of, of Korean Peninsula and not harming their secret interests. That will be very critical uh, things we have to uh, work on it uh, to uh, invite uh, China more strongly to sanction and, and ultimately to unification. There is one term that explains the uh, relation between China and North Korea. That is uh, the lips and teeth relations in Chinese term. Because if you do not have your lip, your teeth might be get cold with the cold wind. <laughs> now the cold wind in Chinese understanding is the United States. If North Korea disappear, they face cold wind from United States, influence of United States all over Korean Peninsula. So there is their strategic calculation from the Cold War period. That is changing, frankly speaking, but not yet enough to change. And we have time for, for one last question. Uh, Katrin, would you please? Katrin Katz, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Northwestern University. Thank you all for your very uh, interesting and timely comments on many facets of North Korea. Uh, I'm interested in hearing about, uh, from the US perspective, it's often difficult to process what it is like to be in Seoul. Uh, here in the US, we see nuclear tests. We see the tempo increasing. We hear about the artillery so close to Seoul, and in a Two lives ago for me, previous life, I uh, helped um, university or recent university graduates settle into Seoul uh, through the Fulbright program. Um, and one of the things I often had to do was to reassure parents that, in fact, their children were safe. They're okay. Uh, <laughs> as, as most of us all know, it's from Korean, uh, Koreans are very resilient and tend to just, life tends to go on as these things happen. But uh, as someone who hasn't live, lived there recently, I'm curious to know whether this sense of threat has manifested itself in terms of changes in daily life for those in Seoul or elsewhere in South Korea, and in particular, if you have time, uh, the current political conversation in terms of the sorts of things the young, uh, the youth of Korea, or not the youth, the different demographics, are asking their politicians to do that. Perhaps they weren't asking them to do five, 10 years ago towards North Korea. Thank you. Life maybe, and soul. Mm -hmm. Maybe first start. I think we feel great threat from the north. They're real threat. They have a capability. They have an intention even to hit, strike some part of Korea. You know, they proved many times throughout the history of the last 70 years. But for their own problem is we have deterrence. Korean people know that we have a deterrence with our strong conventional military capability, and with the support of a U.S. alliance, strong deterrence, uh, conventional, and even extended deterrence against the nuclear threat. And we tend to believe, uh, some people not believe, that, uh, that Kim Jong-un, although he, is, uh, he looks like irrational, but we believe that he's not enough stupid <laughs> to push the button, because that is the end day of him. Uh, I'd like to emphasize 
even if uh, we have a very dangerous regime in the north, don't uh, be afraid of sending your student to the Seoul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, because this nuclear threat doesn't affect our daily lives. And uh, so our daily life very dynamic and very free and very safe. You know, uh, think about the terrorists. You saw the terror in Paris and, and the Brussels, but not in Seoul. So don't worry, so there will be no balance, uh, well, and then the, uh, so you can trust our system. Well, let me just say one thing. Uh, perhaps uh, if we are worried about the security, cons security uh, in, in Seoul, please have a look at the South Korean stock markets. Uh, so far, any kind of you know, the threats from North Korea uh, have not affected the South Korean stock markets. I think that tells a lot. Yeah, one of, one of the things we did while I was doing polling there was we would run a tracker on threat perceptions of, of the current, uh, current life and then in the future. And one thing we would always see anytime there was a provocation at the time, we might see a small increase, but within a matter of four or five days, it would then go back down. And so it would just kind of, except for blips, you know. So I, I was in Seoul for more than 10 years, and so I saw all of the nuclear tests and the change from the first test to later was, was night and day. After the first test, people were, were very nervous. Um, they were, were going out, they were going to the, the grocery store and buying everything that they could. And then later on, it's, it was nothing, essentially. You know, there, during the sinking of the Chunan, there was very little activity. During the, uh, the attack on Yunpyeong Island, where you had smoke coming out of an island from an artillery attack, you know, that was a very shocking moment, but people did not really react in a way where they were going to, to buy things or, or panicking. So in that way, yeah, life just goes on mm -hmm. as normal. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank, of course, EAI for their support. I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Lee and Ambassador Wee down here for, and all the support from the consulate. And please join me in thanking our panelists.